Here you go, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Therefore, the verse of Apostle Paul says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, we receive mercy, we faint not. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We've covered all this, not walking in craftiness, handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. We covered that on Sunday night. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. That's a tragedy. That's what I'm just giving you now. It's hidden to them. In whom the God of this world, that's the devil, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So there's something blocking them from being able to see it. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Um, I tell you what, let's see. Brother Coker, real quick, short, quick, jump us out and give us a prayer, would you please? Amen. Thank you. As you're being seated, look in Romans chapter number 14. Romans 14. Now I get asked this question a lot. And many of you wonder why you hadn't led anybody to the Lord. Why you don't have any uh, power in your, in your presentation of the gospel. I'm not saying it is, but it can be the way you're living. Because the way you're talking doesn't outlive the way you're living. And you, you, can't, you can't do that and expect the gospel when you make the presentation, even though the presentation is a good one, and it may be hermeneutically correct and homiletically correct, and it may have all the points in it and so on and so forth, but people that are lost, ladies and gentlemen, pay more attention to how you live than what you say. The old preacher used to say this, and I'm sure he got it from somebody else, but he said this, the way you live speaks so loudly I can't hear anything you're saying. You ever sat down with somebody and you finally get under conviction and you're getting ready to talk to them a little bit and you start laying out a presentation of the gospel and you start telling them about the Lord and telling them about church and telling them about the Bible or maybe you do old school. You go to them and you just say, let me just tell you what Jesus did for me and the rest of it I'll take you and the preacher can answer it and that kind of thing. And you start doing that and you see them going. You know what they're saying to you? Give me a break, you hypocrite. <laughs> I, you ain't no better Christian than I am. You're telling me you're saved and you're living the way you're living and I'm living the same way you are, but I don't claim to be saved. Now you know, because you know the Bible, that you're saved and you're eternally secure. You know that your standing is safe. Your state may change, right? You understand standing and state. Most of you do. Standing just simply means I'm seated with Him in heavenly places. That's my eternal security. My state changes are based on my fellowship. Now, if you don't get that right, you're going to get the whole Bible messed up because you're going to think the first time you had a bad thought, said a cuss word, didn't do something, say something, do this or do that, you're going to think you lost it. And somebody will convince you you did lose it because you're not living like they're living. You're saved because your soul is saved. Your flesh is never saved until the day you die. And if you got it under control right now, don't get your head lifted up and think you're really something special. Tomorrow still looms. And if not tomorrow, a week later. You say, what can happen? Every one of us can act out and act in the flesh. Yes, sir. And you're still saved and still going to heaven. You say, yeah, but if you don't know what I did two hours ago, you're not lost. You just acted stupid. Amen. And you need to get the thing right. You understand? But somebody will convince you, well, you must not be saved. Well, after a while, you know what will happen? You'll get frustrated trying to get resaved all the time, thinking that it's going to fix that. It never fixes your flesh. Right. It gives you another weapon in your arsenal to use against your flesh. But if you think just being saved is going to make you stop your filthy mouth, you're wrong. If you think it's going to stop your desire for liquor and alcohol, you're wrong. There are exceptions. There are people that he's taken away that addiction because they've uh, decided to commit to him. But for the most part, you know what happens? I just did it last week talking to some individuals. And one guy's telling me in the middle of me talking to this lady who's struggling with a particular addiction. He said, Sister, I just want to say something. Preacher, excuse me for interrupting you. He said, I've been sober now for a four and a half years. He said, you know when the last time was when I wanted a glass of liquor? This morning at 5 a.m. when I opened open my eyes and I go to church and I read my Bible and I pray and I witness and I'm so and so in this church at such and such a place and he said I'm telling you right now sister just because you're saved you are not going to necessarily have power over that it still calls me all the time 
I just looked at him and I said, well, amen, brother. And finally meet an honest man who says, I got to struggle with it every single day. He's not lost. He just recognizes. And he said, what this preacher's telling you is right. He said, the first thing I had to learn was the people that didn't, uh, that were around, that I was around that continued to drink in front of me weren't my friends. He said, I had to get away from them. He said, number two, he said, me personally, I can't go down the grocery store aisle where the beer and wine is. He said, I can taste it. He said, matter of fact, he kind of licked his lips. He said, matter of fact, he said, excuse me, preacher, I'll be done a second here. He said, I can taste it right now. I said, you better quit talking about it. He said, well, that's the other thing, man. He said, the more I think on it, the more I want it. That's it. And he said, I learned I better stay away from places, I better stay away from people, and I better stay away from things that make me have that. He saved. But you know what happens to you? You think, well, I must not be saved. And so you know what happens? You have this thing they call retreading. Well, if you're really saved, you wouldn't have done this. Hogwash. If Galatians 5 is in the Bible and you happen to be in the flesh that day and things didn't hit you right and you got up on the wrong side of the bed and stuff's wrong, you're capable of doing anything except going to hell. <laughs> you, can't, you, ain't, you can't make yourself go to hell. You can deny Jesus Christ right now. If you're saved, you can't go to hell. Well, I just don't believe if you were really saved, you would do that. You don't even know what you're talking about. I'm talking about the Bible. What are you talking about? Opinion? Well, I just kind of feel this way. I just kind of feel like, you know what, that this has been said repeatedly. Well, if you were really saved, you wouldn't commit suicide. Well, maybe you haven't been in the position they're in. They're saved. You say, well, what happened? Well, what do you do with Samson? Well, he died in an act of war. Oh, clean it up any way you want to. He killed himself. You say, what happens? In the heroes of faith. I'm not recommending that you go do that. I'm saying I've seen some people in some really, really bad situations. And by the grace of God, I haven't been there. But I've seen people that said, I can't do it anymore. I'm not going to preach them into hell because of one act. I just believe if you were saved, you wouldn't get a divorce. I just believe maybe you don't know what it's like to live with Jezebel or Ahab. Oh, either side of the coin. Uh, well, I just don't believe if you were saved, you'd do drugs. Maybe you don't know what it's like to live with Jezebel, and that's what you got to do to live with Jezebel. <laughs> I figured out what you're doing in Q&A. You're intentionally not asking questions. <laughs> because you know when you don't ask questions, I'm going to get diarrhea of the mouth. And I'm just going to start hammering out there on whatever's going on at the time, and y'all are just like... I got it. I figured that out today. You're not going to get me next week. You say, why? I'll be in New York. <laughs> Look in Romans chapter 14. Could you please with me for just a moment here? I want you to pick this thing up and uh, look, if you will, please, in verse number 20. Now, I hit this just briefly. I'm just going to tag it and we're going to move on. The, for me, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but, all, but uh, it is evil that that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. All right? So here's what he just said to you. He said, if it offends your brother, don't do it. Even if you have liberty to do it, don't do it. You say, what does that mean? That's to protect your testimony so that when you have an opportunity to present the gospel, even the Apostle Paul, who fully understood the liberty that he now had in Christ and not under the Jewish law anymore, the Apostle Paul said, hey, I don't eat stuff sacrificed to idols, not because I know it ain't no big deal, but because a weaker brother is going to say, Paul, that stuff was sacrificed to idols. And Paul says, hey, it's a good ribeye, man. I don't care. It's a pork set. Paul, I, I, I can't eat pork, Paul. I, I mean, it's a pig. I can't have it. Paul's like, man, you're missing out. More ham and bacon for me. Hey, we're good. Nothing like a pork roast, baby. I mean, we're good to go. Uh, Paul, you know, they're having lobster and shrimp over there. Paul, we can't have that stuff. Paul says, hey, man, pass your plate this way. No. You know what Paul said? Hey, no problem. What would you like to have? Flounder? Snapper? Codfish, salmon, no problem. What would you like to have? For me, don't offend your brother. Just because you can, you can't. Paul said, all things are lawful for me. I can do those things. He's not talking about wicked things. You have a wicked heart if you think Paul is saying, hey, all things are lawful for me. That means I can drink if I want to. That's not what Paul's saying. 
Don't, don't add that kind of stuff to the Bible. That makes you an infidel. You know what he's saying to you? All things are lawful within the reason of the confines of the law of Christ. But all things are not expedient. I, I can do that, but I can't. It's, it's, it's lawful, but guess what? I have to think of others first. Let me give you a quick story about that. I think I've told you this here before, but years ago when we were running prisons with the old preacher and we were over in Tallahassee and we were in the band, it was smoking hot, man. I mean, burning up. We were fixing to, we had taken a break between the last afternoon meeting and the evening meeting that evening. And so we were going to go to Wasino Cat to eat some, uh, some uh, dinner there. And they had a big, they have a big, Sino Cat has about everything you can possibly imagine. They had about four different kinds of buffet things set up there. Uh, for those of you visiting, that's a Chinese place, or Oriental place or whatever. If you hear me say Sino Cat, you say, why do you call it that? Have you ever seen a cat around a Chinese place? I know they say it tastes like chicken, but I'm just saying. What does it taste like? I guess it tastes like chicken, but I've seen some big leg bones in there. Those chickens were either on steroids or it was not chicken, but it tasted like chicken. See, they put enough sauce on that stuff. You get General Sal's chicken. It's got so much crust on it and so much honey and sugar in it. You don't care what it is. You'll eat the bones like that'd be good on cardboard, right? And you're thinking, I'm eating chicken. And back in there, they're going, oh, so good cook. Uh, make everything taste like chicken. Okay, well, that, whatever. But so anyway, so what we did is, is we were there in, uh, in Tallahassee and we pulled on the main drag. And we go to, you know, Hop Singh's place, whatever the name of the place was. And we, go, we pull up in there like that. And there's no parking places. And so we came around the corner and there's this, you know, do drop in, you know, come put your thumbs in your belt line and wear your boots and your hat and, you know, yeehaw and that kind of deal with, you know, it was a bar that was there. And we pulled up, we're, you know, we're not in the front row right in front of the bar, but we're in the next parking row behind the bar. And we pulled up in there and he flung it up in park and he goes, all right, guys, he said a little bit of a walk, but we'll be okay. And the old preacher said, hey, whoa, hey, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, hey, hold on a minute. And he said, yes, sir, you, you don't want to eat at the, whatever the name of the place was, come pow, hum, chong, whatever it was. He said, you don't want to go eat there? And he said, uh, oh, brother, I'd be glad to eat there. But he said, I don't want to park here. And he said, what? And he said, we're going around the corner. Doc said, do you understand what will happen? The second me and Peacock step out of the side door and he opens the other door and I get out, somebody will snap a picture or they'll say, I saw them getting out and going to the bar while they're supposedly running prisons. Yep. Yep. And he said, and you know what? That's all it'll take. Sure. Right. And he said, I'm not getting out. Amen. Amen. And I said, me either. <laughs> Bold as a lion, right? And he goes, well, I mean, if we park down there, Doc said, I walk three miles every day on the barefoot. I can continue to. And I was like, man, you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> and he said, I'm not, eat, I'm not getting out. So we drove around and we wound up parking about a, almost a block down the road and stuff and got out and with great joy. And later on that preacher is sitting there and Doc said, you heard the old adage, haven't you? And, and uh, he said, no, no, sir, which one's that? <laughs> He's a good man, you know. He wasn't thinking about it. And he said, uh, you don't ever bend over and tie your shoes in somebody else's watermelon patch. Well, I got liberty. Not that kind of liberty. You like root beer, don't you? Nothing like a root beer float. You don't think nothing of drinking it out of a brown beer bottle, do you? Well, it's just root beer. I don't care what anybody thinks. I know. It, they, it, you're, not, you're not doing anything wrong. Well, except your testimony. That's it. That's it. Right. Right. You, you, you can't deny timing. Amen. That's not just coincidence. <laughs> Somebody, some, how, why did that happen right then? And I just happened to pause and it just, <laughs> coincidence, the second time tonight. Yeah. But now listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. That's the Christian life. It's you sacrifice for the benefit of other people for the testimony of somebody greater than us. Amen. That's real Christianity.
Real Christianity is not about just feeding poor people and taking care of people that are hungry and going out. It's living the life that is always thinking of the impact on other people first. Amen. And Amen. what people, let me ask you this question before I set you up. What is the most used excuse for people not coming back to church? What? Hypocrites, Hypocrites in the church. Where did they get that idea? Because we say we're one thing, but we do another. Why? We're not applying Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 10, a number of other places. We're not living a life with a WWJD on that says, what would Jesus do? I can tell you what he would do. He wouldn't drink root beer out of a beer bottle. Amen. Jesus wouldn't make an oddity of himself that if he were to come in here like he did Sunday, he wouldn't walk in here in a robe. He'd walk in here in a suit and tie. Sure. I think he might even wear wingtips, but he might not. Sandals, you know, whatever. But here at the bottom line, he's not here to make a spectacle of himself. But you'd never catch the Lord ruining his testimony for the benefit of that. Well, he ate with wine bibbers and all. He ate with them. Right. They're individuals that are lost. He didn't hang out with them. He didn't pick up their attitudes and attributes. He didn't do the things they did. Don't try to turn Jesus into a sinner because you can't live that kind of a life. Now, what's the benefit of that? Well, it just proves you're saved. No, it doesn't. It proves you care more about how you're representing Him than you are about your own reputation. Number two, you know what it does? It allows the gospel that you're trying to present to have power behind it. I remember an old black preacher, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, just giving you some illustrations here. I need to work on illustrations and giving you some illustrations. An old black preacher, he was preaching to a, a preacher's school. And one of the things that he said, that it was imperative, he said, uh, you young preachers, very well-spoken man, very, very educated, smart guy. And he's up there teaching them some things about the ministry. And he said uh, a couple of things that bear repeating when it came to that. He said, you can't outrun your past. So don't create one that you're ashamed of. That's a good thing. Amen. Can't outrun it. Don't create one that I'm ashamed of. Amen. That's pretty solid advice, right? Amen. Now look, all of us in here have past and things we did we shouldn't have done, right? But I'm glad the list is short, yeah. right? But, but one of the things that he said is, you have no power to speak if you're not living it. Amen. You want to be a preacher? you got to live that life so when you stand up here, people aren't like, yeah, that ain't the preacher on the golf course. That ain't the preacher in the fishing boat. That ain't the preacher in the deer stand. That ain't the preacher, in, right? No, it should be the same thing. I don't hunt in a three-piece suit. But my mouth and my actions should be the same. It shouldn't be when I miss the shot that a string of curse words come out. Right? Right? It should be the same, so that then if I went hunting with you, you don't come in here and go, oh. I should be the same at his barber shop when I sit down to get my fur cut as I am here, or her shop, right. or whoever's shop. Sure. That's right. I should be the same there that I am here. I might have on jeans and a t-shirt or a golf shirt or whatever, but I should be the same. It's not the suit that is the man. Amen. You say, why? Well, suppose somebody comes in and wants to hear the gospel, and then they... Think, uh -oh, what are you telling me the gospel for, man? You live like the devil. That's modern stuff. Now, I'm going to offend some of you, and I'm just giving you a warning. Please don't be offended because I'm not done yet. One of the things that does more damage to the gospel than anything else is preachers. Now, see, I'm talking about me. I'm not even talking about you. They put on jeans and a golf shirt and they talk to you in a kind of a low, sort of a seductive tone. And they give you everything except what the Bible says. And then they go sit down with you at Hooters or somewhere and have a beer with you. Amen. And listen to the same rock and roll music. And go out on the same dance floor. I mean, they might crack open their Bible and sit there and read their Bible at the table while they're drinking a beer. And then when they get up and preach, you're thinking... Why should I change? <laughs> I mean, why should I be any different? I mean, if he's drinking and carousing around, what makes you think he's not doing other things? I know you. You're people. You what are you? You're suspicious. Preachers hurt the gospel more than people do. 
you have people calling, preaching what they call the gospel, it's all full of just prosperity and God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be happy in eternity. If you get some happiness down here, grab a hold of it, hold on to it as long as you can. It ain't going to last long. You say, why? It's called life. All right, come down now, if you will, please, to verse number three. We're going expositorily here. This is important. Uh, he gives you reasons uh, that the church should have this effect on me uh, because it should uh, call, allow me to affect others. Do you tell people about Jesus? I mean, people you work with, students you go to school with, family, do you tell them? Or does it kind of get stuck because it's going to get in the way of whatever your agenda is? I'm not talking about you're supposed to be doing it at work, but how about on break? There's always a reason, but I'm saying, are you at all? Are you telling people about Jesus at all? Oftentimes the reason that we don't tell them is, is because we haven't been affected. We don't realize that's what I'm supposed to tell them. I'm not saying tell them about the church. I'm saying tell them about Jesus. Jesus is the life changer, not the church. All right, look, if you will, please, at verse number three. If our gospel, that's the Apostle Paul's gospel, that's the death, burial, and resurrection, be hid, who is it hid to? They're lost. So as a result, guess what happens? You become their Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, don't be so hard on them. They don't know any different. A lot of them were raised in that atmosphere. They know there's something missing inside. And so they go to church. At least give them accolade. They're going to church. At least they're going there on a Sunday as opposed to not to going to the beach or going to the dog track or the pony track or whatever else they could be doing. I mean, at least they went to church. I didn't say condone where they're going, but before you jump down their throat, could you understand the gospel's been hidden from them. They don't get it. They don't understand. Oftentimes when you say to somebody, said to a fellow on the plane the other day, I said, you know, he's talking to me and I said, well, hey, when would you get saved? And he goes, oh, well, you know, I went to camp a long time ago. I got baptized in the lake. Uh, I think I was 16 years old. I said, that's great. That's wonderful. What I said was, is when did you get saved? He goes, I told you. I went to a youth camp and I got baptized. I think I was 16 years old. I said, okay, let me just ask it maybe a different way because I'm probably not formulating the question right. I do that sometimes. I said, when did you come to a personal knowledge of your need for Jesus Christ to save you from hell and from sin? He goes, what? Yeah, amen. And I said, see, that's what being saved means to me. You could see him. He goes, well, well, I said, is that what you did when you, were, when you were 14, 15, whatever, when you went to camp and you did that and then they baptized you? He goes, no, I didn't do that. I just, everybody was lining up by the lake and the preacher was dunking people, or he didn't say dunking, baptizing people. And he said, so I put on one of them things and I got baptized. He said, I thought, I thought that means you're saved. And I said, you're saved if you admitted you were a sinner, you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you confessed him as your savior. He goes, well, I believe Jesus died and rose again, was buried and rose again. He said, I believe that. I said, do you believe he died for your sins? I said, the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15 is how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and was buried and raised again the third day according to the scripture. He died for your sins. He said, I never heard nobody tell me that. And I said, well, you're just an idiot. They should just kick you off. I hope you got a parachute on. Open up the emergency exit. And <laughs> you know what I realized? He didn't know. He literally wasn't afraid to talk about the Lord at all. It's an unusual thing for me to talk about him on the plane, especially early in the morning. I'm usually like not. And I just was like, hey, a little conversation and that kind of a deal. He wasn't ashamed of it at all. Amen. I mean, he's like, let's talk about it. Talk about Jesus, you know, and all that kind. But when I said, are you saved? Yeah, yeah, I got baptized and all that. Well, let me go a little further. And when I did, he was like, you know what? I left him and said, oh, I led him to the Lord, man. I mean, the Shekinah glory came down the whole plane. So, no, nothing changed. But boy, I left him with this question mark, this perplexity of, 
I said, listen, man, it's like ABC. Admit you're a sinner. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess Him as your Savior. I said, you think about that kind of a thing. And uh, consider those things. And, uh, you know, I'm down with the church down there in Jacksonville. You want to look us up? Look us up. You want to call me? Call me. I'd be glad to help you any way I can. Here's what I know. The gospel's hid to them. And the devil is a master at sidetracking them at what I call watch the birdie theology. Yeah. And what he does is has them involved in a religious activity. They go to a church that has a Bible, it has a preacher, and it feels that way. And you're thinking, how could they do that? See, you only know better because you have the book. They don't know any better. They can't help that. Can you imagine this? If you were raised in a foreign country and you were taught Muslim theology, you were raised since you were a little baby, as soon as you could remember, you were raised to believe Muslim theology. Do you think you would immediately convert? Do you ever just thank God I wasn't raised that way? Because if I was raised that way, I'd probably be that way. You ladies, you'd be in a burqa. You say, why? Because that's culture. You, you, you think, you look at it now and you think, oh, I would never do that. That's because you have more knowledge. You know things. Could I ask you this? If you were raised Roman Catholic, raised grandmama, mama, great grandmama, Catholic, godfather, godmother, going there, taking the mass, watching the wafer, taking the juice, going in. Bless me, Father, for I've sinned like you used to do when we were back there in the portal. They left that part out of the video. We had a portal it back there when we were a whole lot smaller and all the men went back there and you guys would come up when I was in the bathroom in there and say, bless me, Father, for I've sinned. <laughs> and y'all remember doing that too. I said, y'all leave me alone, you know, and then every now and then you go, preacher, it's an earthquake, it's a rapture, you know, I'm like, man, that's back in the, back in the day. That's funny, that's funny. It was between church. Y'all were getting back at me because back in those days, one sermon was at least two hours long. But, but here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. Pause and think about it. If you were raised Catholic and everything you'd ever done was Catholic and then somebody gives you the gospel, do you not think religion would hide the gospel from you? If a priest has told you since you were knee-high to a grasshopper and you went through the confirmation process and you had taken all the catechism classes and then you get up there and the priest is constantly telling you, you can't know, you don't know, there's no way to know, you better stay in the Catholic church, you better take the wafer, you better confess the sins to the guy in the box and when you die, I hope you make it. Do you think the first time a guy came along and said, nah, none of that will help you at all. All you got to do is admit, believe, and confess. Do you think you'd be like, oh, wow, I see that now. You say, why? Religion blinds more people than wickedness. People that have no religious affiliation, man, they are much easier to get in the boat than somebody that's religion. You say, why? Listen, let me just give you this as an example. I'm talking about it being hid. Are you staying with me? Are we doing okay? I'm talking about it being hid. You don't want to get in an argument with a charismatic until you find out whether or not they're actually saved. Two reasons. Number one, 1 Corinthians 2 says, The natural man receives not things of spirit, they're spiritually discerned. Neither can he know them. Number two, he has been taught that evidence that he is saved is he can speak in some tongue he can't understand. Now you get into an argument with him and you show him 1 Corinthians 2 and 1 Corinthians 4 or 12 and 1 Corinthians 14 and you lay all that stuff down, rightly divided, right down the middle, show him it's a language, show him it has nothing to do with this and that and the other. You know why he doesn't accept that? Not because it's not the truth, it's because if you take that away from him, he thinks he's lost. Amen. You don't even know if he's saved yet. So you have to find out what is saved. Oh, I know I'm saved. How do you know I'm saved? Ashil Shantai, Antai, Abotai, Economy, Honda. What? Yeah, see, I have the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. What, what is the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Ashtala, Shantai, Antai, Abotai, Economy, Honda. Uh, okay. Are you saying tongues is the initial evidence? The initial evidence of a saved individual is they publish the gospel boldly. When was the last time you told somebody about Jesus? Amen. You know what they generally do? They tell them about their gift. Because they're always questioning, am I saved? Well, I must be saved, even though I was out getting drunk last night and doing stuff I shouldn't be doing. I still got it. You know why? Because they're taught that if they lose that, they lost the Holy Spirit. And then you come along and you show them the truth, and you're like, what is wrong? You're an idiot. No, religion has blinded them. 
So you have to find a way to be able to get in there without being so quick to be offended by the fact that they're not grabbing, picking up what you're putting down because for years you've had that hammered home. It is so solid. It's like waking up in the morning from the majority of you. But they've never heard that. They've heard the other since they were knee high to a grasshopper. And they could not wait when they were a little kid until the day came where they went to the altar and they were told to hold on, to let go, and to keep practicing and keep practicing. And then one day they keep practicing their tongues and now they can speak in them. And so now they're saved. So you know what happens? The Bible says the gospel's hid to them that are lost. So don't expect everybody you give the gospel to for them to see it. It's hidden. All right, look at this secondly, if you could here. Uh, it, it's very difficult for them to understand. First of all, you need to have the testimony. I showed you that. Second of all, the message needs to be clear. But third of all, you need to know who you're talking to. And whether or not the idea of them being lost is the same idea of what... See, we have vernacular that we use. When I say saved, for you it means death, burial, resurrection. Trust of Jesus Christ, you know, some of you'll even know the day. 14th of March, 19, okay. Some of us will say, I was seven, I was in Miami, I got saved, blah, 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 give a testimony. But we know when we say saved. But other than people that are Bible-believing Baptist, whatever, you know what? They don't know what saved means. And when you're talking that way, you're thinking, are you saved? Oh, yeah, they're saved. How do you know they're saved? Well, I asked them, they said they were saved. Is the vernacular the same? Have you ever been in a discussion with somebody and you're trying to say one word and it means one thing to you, but it means something entirely different to them? Miss Brenda, I'm not talking about you and Brother Ernie. You immediately punched him and went. Oh, he preaching now. Mm -hmm. Yes, he is. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying that even in other language, our language is interpreted differently to them. So making sure they understand that. All right. Here's the fourth thing that you need to know very clearly. Who it is that's blinding them and who it is that you're fighting. Amen. Right. Can I say this to you very carefully, very kindly and very graciously. You're not fighting the person. You're fighting for one of the devil's kids. Amen. Now let me ask you a question, ma'am. If you had a child and Mr. Stranger Danger was trying to take the child, would you just stand by and go, well, I guess they'll be okay? No, not a chance, right? This is a great answer. What mom in here would be like, yeah, you know, Mr. Weirdo over here, is, it's okay. It's no big, they'll figure it out. Or would you be like, oh, oh, uh, mm, 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 right? Mama bear comes out, right? Am I right? When you're messing with someone that is lost, of all the things that you can do to garner the devil's immediate attention, because you're messing with one of his kids and you are trying to snatch them out of his house. Several years ago, I had a case. It's been a bajillion years ago now. And what this guy would do is at nighttime, besides dressing up in a diaper and wearing Nike tennis shoes, is he would go into the houses at nighttime, find a window, pry open the window, take the child out, do ungodly, unspeakable things, and put the child back in there. Had the whole town on high alert and all that kind of stuff until we finally caught him. But let me say this to you. Everybody was on guard because they were upset about the audacity of a stranger coming into their house, taking their child out, out and doing whatever they wanted to with them and then bring the child back and try to convince the child that they just had a dream. And, and it's a very long deal, very complex deal, very complicated before we caught him. But can I say this to you? If you can understand how you would feel if someone broke into your house and took your child and did ungodly, unspeakable things to that child, how would that make you feel? And if you could prevent it when that stranger was in your house, what would you do? Some of you who have said, oh, well, I'm not a violent person and this and that, let them mess with your kid. Amen. And all of a sudden, all that stuff you said, it goes the way of the American Indian, right? Amen. And then the next thing you know, some kind of like Geronimo comes out in you. 
and you're grabbing anything and everything and you're going to teach that stranger, you don't come into my house and mess with my kids. Am I right? Okay. Do you understand the analogy? All right. When you're witnessing to somebody, you're in his house. You're in his yard. You're in what they used to call legally, you're within the curtilage of what he owns. Burglary is actually when you break that curtilage, even if you're not in the house yet, but because you're in there with that intent, once you break through that fenced yard and step in there, you're guilty of breaking and entering. As soon as you do that, the devil immediately sends someone to immediately confront you. Have you ever wondered if why after you go out on the street and preach or after you go out and witness and the next thing you know, you come home and you and your wife are like, OMG, what just happened? Because the devil's mad and he's saying, you are going to pay for preaching the gospel, for trying to lead one of my kids astray, for trying to take somebody out of my house and I'm not going to put up with it and you talk about grabbing a lion by the tail and getting the bad end of it. That's going to be you. That's why people don't preach, they don't talk, and they don't try to win people to the Lord. Why? The devil makes them pay. When you are trying to do something to lead people out of his house, you immediately come under attack. And if you're in his house, where do you think he will attack you? He will attack you, not in God's house, in your house. Because you're messing with his kids. Do you understand that? And spiritually speaking, you're messing with eternity. Not just a couple hours. Eternity. And guess what? It makes him mad. He doesn't care enough about them to protect them. He lets them get involved in everything, include getting killed. But you know what he does care about? When you start trying to get them to leave by their own free will his house and come with you to Jesus' house, you say, who is it that blinds them? The devil. The Bible said so. Satan, the God of this world, hath blinded the minds of them that would believe. So the next thing you know, you'll find out when you're witnessing, they'll sidetrack you. You can't keep them on what's important. Let's just talk about being saved. Let's talk about trusting Jesus Christ. Let's talk about heaven and hell. You know, there's a lot of hypocrites in the church. Amen. Positively, no question about it. Let's talk about heaven and hell. What do you think about this thing with the homosexuals and their rights? And what about this gender identity stuff and all that? That's a definitely topic to be discussed a little bit later on. Well, what do you think about the politics and who's in the White House? And do you think Trump's going to run? Do you think uh, so-and-so's going to run? And this and that and the other. Do you think he's going to be indicted? Let's talk about where you're going to spend eternity. Eternity. All of that is not the person. That's the devil to get you sidetracked. You say, why? It's playing to your, oh, they want to know my opinion. They want to know because they think I'm smart. I'm, I'm very wise. That's why they want to know what I think about all of these things. And then next thing you know, you know what got you? Pride got you. And guess what happens to the soul? They're safe in the arms of the devil. All right? That's the fourth thing that you need to know. They're blinded. They're blinded because there is no vision. And guess what? Because there is no vision, the people perish. And people perish because of a lack of knowledge. All right? How do I defeat that? We got about five minutes. Everybody okay? Y'all are making me nervous, man. I'm getting cotton mouth tonight. Notice what he says here in, uh, let's see, where am I at? Let's go to verse number five. That's it. Uh, now watch. Here's what Paul said. Paul begins to tell you about the, the light of the glorious gospel who is the image of God and should shine unto them. So the devil is doing what he can to prevent them from seeing it. Right? Have you ever been witnessing to somebody and have them make this statement to you? I just don't see it. You should right off the bat go, I know who it is that knocked your eyes out of your head. I know who it is that kept you from seeing it spiritually. Now you recognize you're literally confronting an entity that is there who was sent by the devil on a special, uh, I mean a special uh, uh, job to keep you from getting through to that person. Well, what do I do? Well, when the Lord faced the devil, what did he do? What did he use? Scripture. This is a great place to recognize 
I can't fight it with my wisdom. I can't fight it with my intellect. I can't fight it with my cool words and the things to say at the right time and all the cool ways they teach you to try to witness like a gimmick. Look, don't try to ever gimmick somebody to Jesus. Amen. Don't, 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 you know, smoke and mirror them. Don't, don't bait and switch them. Don't, don't do that. The gospel is supposed to be truth. Amen. And it should therefore be pure. Don't, don't gimmick people to death with all these little tricks of how to get them in the boat. You're not putting anybody in the boat in the first place. Can I just take some pressure off of you? You're nothing, literally, you're just a messenger. You're literally, you are the hole of a donut. Do you know what that is? It's a nothing. You just happened to at that time for the Lord to reach down and of all the gloves He chose, He put that glove on and He said, here's what I want you to do. But you're a glove, you're not the hand. The hand that's given you the ability to, that's Him. So you can't be like, oh, well, I know how to lead somebody to the Lord. You'd be surprised, man. I've seen people that don't even know fully everything to say. They're just like, well, all I know is the Lord saved me. I was going to hell not coming out of the sky. I mean, going to hell, like going to burn. And I know that I had to admit I was a sinner. That wasn't hard at all, man. Lord God, I know I'm a sinner. I had to believe on Jesus Christ to save me. Couldn't believe it, but I did. Couldn't believe he would die for somebody like me. And you know what I'm doing? I'm confessing him now as my Savior. Well, it can't be that simple. Well, it was for me. If it wasn't, I probably wouldn't have got in. And wouldn't you like to get in? That's it. Well, I don't really understand things. Listen, why don't you come to church with me? But before you do, you might die before time for church. I had a lady call me one time. You know what she said to me? She said, preacher, I can't wait for Sunday. I said, well, why is that? She goes, because I want to get saved. And I said, well, you can get saved now. She goes, really? I thought I had to come to church. I said, uh, let's take care of that now. And then I'll meet you at church on Sunday. But what happens if you die for them? He said, or she said, I was scared to death that I was going to die before Sunday. Now see, y'all are like, oh, that's kind of silly. Not for somebody that's really under conviction. Feels like I'm fixing to burn like a, like a stinking roasted marshmallow that fell in the fire yesterday. One of them you was making for them s'mores. <laughs> Mashing between that cracker with a Hershey bar. And, and you know what she's afraid of? I, I, I hope I stay alive. I hope I stay alive. I hope I stay alive. Well, uh, let's just fix it right now. So Amen. if you die tonight, Amen. you're good to go. Amen. See what happened? A letter to the Lord over the telephone. Amen. I say a letter to the Lord. You say, what did I do? I stood there while the fruit fell. <laughs> I didn't do nothing. I think the Lord was hearing her all the time. Yeah. You say, well, she didn't know the right words. She had the right heart. Amen. Well, but the Bible says, oh, shut up, man. You think the Lord is going to look at somebody that's that sincere that would call me and say, I can't wait for Sunday. I can't wait for Sunday. I, I hope I don't die before Sunday. I want to get saved. Oh, okay, well, how about we just do that now? Can you do that? See, she was raised in a thing that you can't get saved anywhere but church. Can I just help you to understand that when you're doing that, you're not confronting the person. And sometime that stinking sulfuric breath can come at you and they can say some very, very ill things. Take a breath. Don't take it personal. Understand that what is inside of them is mad at what's inside of you. And the two of them are having a come to Jesus moment. And that thing, just like the maniac of Gadara, is hollering at Jesus. You just happen to be in the way of the conversation. That's good. That's good. Be kind. They are under control of a demonic entity. Their owner, the father, the devil, has them under control. Don't take offense. Say, okay, we'll circle back around and try again. All right, now watch. Here's what he does. Here's how he fix it. Paul says, watch this. For we, for we what? What do they preach? Well, let me tell you about when I, no, Paul's very careful to say, we don't preach ourselves. This is not the time for you to break things down into how everything went for you. He said, but tell them about what? Tell them about who? Can I please tell you why? 
Because at this point, your testimony has no effect. You're trying to get the blocker out of the way, and the only way you can do that is not with your testimony. Remember when the apostles, the boys are up there on the mountaintop there in Matthew uh, 17? Remember when they get up there at that uh, place, and they come down, and there's a boy down there, and uh, he's possessed of a devil? And the apostles have tried and tried and tried to get him to come out. Right? Do you remember that? And the Lord comes down and said, This kind comes not out but by prayer and fasting. Right? There's a demonic entity that is there that is preventing them, and they don't have the power to do it. So the Lord has to do it. Okay, is the Lord not the incarnate Word? Yes. Okay, so do you understand this? This is where it ceases to be about you and how many ears you can put on your belt. This is where it begins to be like, oh, okay, I know who I'm dealing with now. I need to preach. And all you ladies are like, well, I can't be preaching. You can there. It's not a pulpit. Right. When you're preaching, he's just talking about, tell them about Jesus. You say, why? That demonic entity cannot hear, cannot stand to hear the death, burial, and the resurrection. It's time, Paul says, for me to preach not ourselves, not all we've done, where we've been, what we've been through, all that. No. He said, now's the time. Just tell them about Jesus. It doesn't matter anyway. They're already upset with you. So Paul says, I'm recognizing who's got them blinded. I can't break through that. I'm not going to you know, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, hocus pocus, dominocus. I'm not doing all that. You know what I'm going to do? You know, Jesus Christ died on the cross to save you and me from our sins. He was buried and raised again the third day. You say, it can't be that simple. Oh, that's just preaching Jesus. You say, but I don't know much about Jesus. Okay. Do you know that he went to the cross for your, cross for your sins? Do you know that he was buried? Do you know that he raised again the third day? Amen. Do you believe that? Amen. That's all you have to say. Amen. You say, but preacher, that just doesn't sound like enough and all that. Don't complicate it. Right. Don't complicate it. You say, what? You're dealing with an entity. By the way, you're telling him something he already knows. Amen. The person can't hear you until he's out of the way. The only way to clear him out of the way is the Apostle Paul said, I've learned, listen, if anybody knew about casting out devils and dealing with devils, would you agree Paul did? You know what he said? We don't preach ourselves. This ain't the time to, hey, come to church. We got a rock and roll party. Got a pizza party. Oh, we got pool tables. We got ping pong. We got a building. We got this. No, 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 no. He said, no, 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 stop. It's not about you. What you've been through. What addictions you've overcome. How bad your testimony was. Paul said, no, preach Jesus. But preacher, I'm not a preacher. Look, here's preaching Jesus. Jesus Christ died for your sins according to Scripture. He was buried and He raised again the third day according to the Scripture. Now why did He do that? He did that because you and I would have gone to hell without it and He gave us a way out. Amen. Now guess what happens? That demon is going, man, why would you have to say that? Because most times, you know what that demon does? He gets us talking about ourself. And I don't know about you, I'll just speak for me. Whenever I get to talking about myself, it's kind of hard to get me to shut up. I mean, I don't get that many opportunities, but when you get kind of get to doing it, and then probably not you, Ross, because you're like pure as a driven snow, living right at the foot of the cross. When we see perfect Christian, we see there's Ross's name right there as the illustration. But, but a lot of times when we start talking about our, ourselves, we tend to embellish the story a bit. It called, speaking of evangelists, to kind of blow it up a little where everybody can see it better. Again, not you. I'm just saying me. And then that lie has now, instead of running the devil off, it strengthened the devil. Because all lies come from the father of lies. And even though we were well-meaning, we just told a lie by stretching the truth. And now the devil's like, you think you're going to get rid of me with the gospel? <laughs> he says, sanctify them with truth. Thy word is truth, you liar. Mm -hmm. wow. yeah. You're telling them about the truth of the word of God? <laughs> you liar. The devil's got you thinking things were one way when they weren't that way, and the next thing you know, it becomes reality in your mind. Think about it long enough. Oh, you will convince yourself. 
Can I say this to you uh, quickly? Man, they used to teach us about how to, when you're interviewing, uh, especially young children, you have to be very, very, very careful not to implant an idea or a thought in their mind because the kid will grow the story on their own. So in order to make sure that you get to the absolute truth, you literally have to think how you're formulating a question so as not to produce or create an innuendo or to create a scenario in which it didn't occur, but because they think they're supposed to do what the adult wants them to do, they will try to tell you to the point of literally making up a story because they think that's what you're looking for. Now understand, they don't have the ability to reason. And so because of that, they grab the story you're telling them. And then in their mind, they finish it. I mean, lock, stock, and barrel. They got, they got, they got all the detail. Oh, it must be true. Yeah, but here's the problem. It wasn't their thought. It was yours. So what begins to happen is, is that instead of you just telling them, listen, here's all I know to tell you. Jesus Christ died for our sins, mine and yours. And he was buried and he was raised again the third day. I'm not going to hell because I trusted him to save me. And if you want to change your eternal destination, this is what you have to do. You have to believe he died for your sins because you are a sinner. Amen. Amen. And he was buried and raised again the third day. That's all I'm here to say. And then you stop. I'll show you the rest on Sunday if you'll come back. But can I just say this to you? Do you understand that when you're in the process of witnessing, it is imperative that you stick with the truth. Please don't ever embellish the story to try to make it more dramatic than it already is. That's being done nowadays. Don't add a whole bunch of fluff and promises that are simply not promises you can make. Oh man, I trusted Jesus and man, my bank account went up and my corns quit aching me, my back quit hurt and my wife loves me and boy, we're happier than we've ever been. You don't say that. Maybe it is that way for you. Good. God bless you. There ain't no guarantee of that. You know all you can tell them? If you trust Jesus Christ, when you die, you won't go to hell. Amen. Yeah. What can you tell them beyond that? Just that when you die, you ain't going to go to hell. Amen. It's not your job to tell them anything else. The Holy Spirit will guide them through time. Once they get that, they'll realize that they're uh, ignorant concerning certain things, not stupid, just not been taught, and He'll give them direction. And then that's where you can minister to them, disciple them, do those kind of things, and bring them to church. But do you understand what I'm trying to get across to you? When it comes to the gospel, it's the simplicity that makes people pause and go, really? That's why even a child can tell somebody, hey, Death, burial, resurrection. Because a child understands, that's all I have to offer you. But our problem is, is we kind of add ourself in the mix. Sure. Yeah. It's so dangerous. Especially if they start watching you because they don't get saved the first time you talk to them. The devil will see to it that you show out right when they're looking at you. Yeah, that's it. And then they'll go, that was a joke. And then you have a hard time putting them back on the hook. Yep. Amen. That's right. Once you do that, your job's done. Because ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit that leads them to Jesus anyway. Amen. You actually, in all honesty, you don't really lead anybody to the Lord. Right. You just say, there He is. <laughs> you present Him. Amen. But they have to make their own steps. Mm -hmm. Right? Does that make sense to you? So tomorrow, just recognize, hey, guess what? Preacher, I've been witnessing to people and nobody's getting saved. Okay, now you're armed with the fact that you've been dealing with somebody other than people. I'm in his house right now. That doesn't mean that you have to be like a snail with tennis shoes on walking across a carpet. It doesn't mean you have to be quiet. Shh. It, it means you can be, let the Lord lead you to be as bold as you need to be. Don't be a jerk. Amen. Oftentimes our boldness is, a place, it is in place of ignorance. 
And the reason we get mad and loud is simply one thing. We don't realize we're fighting the devil and now he's made you angry. Well, guess what the Bible says? That's a foothold for the devil. Am I right? Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. For we are not ignorant, neither give place to the... It's right in the passage, Ephesians 4, right? The other one's 2 Corinthians 2. When that happens, guess who steps in there? It's not the Lord. The devil's now been allowed to come into the house. Okay? All right, I hope that helps you.